it is very, very, very cool to be here. I can't believe there are 23 people in this meeting, at least, that are counting days. That's absolutely unbelievable in the most positive way. Uh, I, <laughs> it's not hard to make me like cry, but I teared up when I saw how many people were still counting days. I'm, I think sometimes get used to going to meetings where everyone has some time and it feels great, but there is nothing there's nothing like seeing someone at the beginning of the journey because I remember it very, very, very too vividly. So I'm not sure how the shares usually go here, what the formats are. Um, so like I said, I'm Julia, I'm an alcoholic. I My sobriety date is April 1st, 2020. I just celebrated one year. I came into recovery in September of 2019. I picked up three newcomer chips before I picked up my one year chip. I have a sponsor who I call as often as I can. I go to as many meetings as I can in a week and I do as much service as I can. And service is a very big part of my story, but I'll get to that. So, I was born in Vancouver, which is on the west coast of Canada. The only reason that's important is it's because it's not Montreal where I am now. So I grew up in Vancouver. I am incredibly privileged. Um, I did not want for anything growing up. My parents were married, if not <laughs> in love. Um, but there were a lot of messed up, not messed up, a lot of flawed dynamics in my family, a lot of resentment, a lot of passive aggressiveness and a lot of guilt and shame were at the foundation of my life. I remember feeling very uncomfortable and anxious from the beginning and trying really, really hard to make other people happy, particularly my mom who was pretty miserable as I was growing up and who I was very, very close with. And my brother who had a lot of issues himself and hated, hated me. And I, I spent a lot of energy and time trying to make both of them happy, which eventually I think fed into a sort of constant dissatisfaction with myself because I wasn't doing the thing that I felt I was supposed to be doing. I wasn't accomplishing my purpose. Anyway, uh, pretty generic childhood. I have memories of being in elementary school and feeling homesick, but not to go to my actual home. I felt like there was somewhere I belonged that wasn't where I was and it wasn't home, like where my parents lived, but that like maybe aliens would pick me up and I'd finally be at that place. Like I would feel like I was in the right spot and I wouldn't have that sort of scooped out hollow feeling inside. <sighs> As is always the case, hormones didn't help. Puberty was rough. High school was uh, a pretty intense time. Lots of depression, drama, um, just lots of sensitivity to everything and very few ways of coping with it in a healthy manner. So I uh, fell into some self-harm. And when I discovered drinking and drugs, though I won't talk about drugs, it was a relief. It was such a relief because I, 
I could finally slow down and not have to think about everything before I did it. You know, it just, it simplified everything. I would just talk and I would be the type of person that I knew I could be, but had trouble being the rest of the time. I'd be funny, outgoing, confident, and I made a lot of friends that way. And it served me pretty well. I was still miserable and had bad habits and psychological issues, but it also helped me get by. It was an escape that I really, really, really felt I needed at the time. Um, yeah, as they say in the rooms of AA often, it was my solution until it became my problem. Uh, it was pretty clear to me early on that I had an unhealthy relationship with alcohol, but I thought it was the same as everyone else's. Especially when I got to university, you know, everyone is, it's the thing and it keeps being the thing. And you, I, we joke about it being a problem. And, uh, and then slowly, you know, people started moving away. People were getting older and I wasn't calming down and life wasn't becoming easier the way I thought it would be. Uh, I wasn't figuring out how to be a person in the way that I assumed was natural for everyone else. I felt like I was clinging, always just clinging to the surface of my life and often just wanted to give up. <laughs> I think a big theme of my life was just a lack of resilience. Like I just didn't want to deal with anything. I would rather, I'd rather go to sleep than, <laughs> than do anything else. You know, I, I, I just felt like I didn't have the energy. Um, I went through a breakup with a long-term partner, partially, I think, because I wanted to not be supervised anymore. I was tired of being told that maybe I had a problem. I was tired of saying that I was trying to do something about it. And uh, I quickly hit a bottom after that. Um, I won't go too much into detail because that's really not why we're here. Um, but it got to a point where it was dangerous for me. I was doing a lot of drinking alone. I was doing a lot of passing out. I enjoyed doing that a lot. And every time I tried to set a limit for myself, I would just like, I'd smash it and go beyond that. I'd say, okay, I'm only gonna have 10 drinks this week, or I'm only gonna drink three nights this week. And I would, every time I set one of those goals, I would just go to the extreme and it's, okay, actually I'm gonna drink every night this week, or I'm gonna have 10 drinks tonight. And then, well, I've already gone over 10 drinks. So what's the point in doing the rest of it? Um, I got myself into a very dangerous situation that was sort of a eye-opening thing. And I ended up going to inpatient treatment, um, which I felt terrified, mostly because I knew that the optics meant that it would be really hard for me to drink soon after because people would be watching. You know, they know you've gone away to rehab. When you come out, they're going to expect you not to drink or they're going to be pretty judgy if you do. Um, I was terrified at the concept of not being able to drink again. And I kept, I kept seeing this image of me, like I kept having this idea of what if, like, how can I, what if I get married, what I'm not allowed to drink on my wedding day? That's insane. That's tragic. That's the worst thing I can imagine. Like I would be crying on the ground thinking about this, um, <laughs> uh, which is, which now 
to me, the idea of being hungover the day after a big event, like my wedding or whatever, uh, is heartbreaking. And I'm the idea of being drunk at a event, a huge event like that scares the shit out of me. And it is not appealing at all. Anyway, I was introduced to AA through that rehab. I eventually came to realize that I was an alcoholic mostly through a thought experiment that someone proposed where they said, okay, imagine you're sitting at a table, there's a glass of alcohol on the table, but can you not drink it, basically? And I pictured that sitting on the chair, the glass of alcohol on the table, being like, okay, I don't wanna drink it. I'm not supposed to drink it. I can't drink it. And I could not, even in my brain, pretend or imagine that I would pour it down the sink. Even in this situation I had complete control of, like I was itching inside to not get rid of it. Um, and I realized that's how it always was. Part of my brain was always thinking about where I'd be getting the next drink, when I'd be socially acceptable, time to get another one. Do I go to the bathroom now to do it? Um, and that was a huge relief in getting sober was clearing out that little part of my brain that I didn't realize was taking up so much space, constantly thinking about it. Um, one of the first meetings I went to outside of outpatient was the 30 day program. The first meeting I went to was a woman's meeting and a girl happened to be there who was the only person even close to my age and she happened to be there even though she never goes to that meeting, she never went back. And I met her and we started talking and she told me about Monkey Paw, which if you can see in my name, I have monkeypaw.org in there, which is the Montreal, Quebec Young People of AA. So it's a young people's organization that helps organize events um, to connect young people in Montreal to Alcoholics Anonymous. Basically, we throw the Halloween party, we organize the New Year's Eve party, etc. Now, with everything online, we try, try to do fun stuff online. Anyway, she told me about that and she invited me to come. And I genuinely, I cannot say that I would be sober today if I hadn't met that girl at that meeting and trusted her and gone with her to the service meeting because service has very legitimately saved my life. Um, it's kept me sober. It gave me a reason, like an avenue to meet new people. AA meetings are absolutely wonderful and they're a great way to meet people, but service, I had no choice but to participate. Like I couldn't sit at the back and do nothing. Um, young people also is defined as anyone who still has growing to do. So really the age range in this type of service is Anybody, anybody who wants to have fun in sobriety and make it fun for other people. So I got to meet people who, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, part of it was a shallow thing of, okay, these people aren't completely, I don't know if I can swear, completely freaking like losers. These are people that I, I would hang out with. These are people that are not what I pictured when I pictured AA, they're not, sad old people in a basement uh, crying about alcohol. <laughs> they were cool. And some of, <laughs> some of them were really attractive, okay? Maybe that was a reason I kept coming back as well. Doesn't matter, I kept coming back and it became one of the best parts of my life. Um, one of the greatest gifts that Monkey Paw gave me was a few months in when we planned the New Year's Eve party and it was executed. Um, I did a lot of service that night. I did coat check, setting up, takedown. And for me, it makes me far more comfortable to have a reason to be somewhere rather than socializing. If I have a job to do, a task, something that I can either hide behind or go back to and lean on, I feel much more comfortable. Um, and that was definitely the case that night I was there for like six or seven hours and, you know, doing code check got me to talk to people. And there was a point in the night where I was just 
so full of happiness. And I was like, holy shit, like, this is one of the best times I've ever had. And I'm being the person that I always, like my best self, you know, that would come out when I was drinking. I say best self in real quotation marks because, you know, it was a very small period of time that best self even lasted. Um, and it wasn't my best self. Anyway, I realized I was being the person I wanted to be and I was genuinely having fun. And I wasn't thinking about that calculation of how to keep my buzz going. And I didn't feel that weird guilt that I never even noticed that I felt, that weird guilt of, oh, I'm tricking people because this isn't who I really am. Because it is who I am. Like just being myself, I was able to have so much fun. And I know it sounds corny, but it was literally life-changing. Um, a lot of things that I heard in early sobriety, I really took to heart and I'm really grateful that I did. In the rooms of Montreal, you hear a lot of like, uh, shut up and listen. I'm not a big fan of that particular language, but a version that I heard in Vermont, I think it was, they say, just get in the car, like just get in the car, you know? Uh, and that that's really it. I just had to show up and get in the car. In early recovery, I there wasn't a lot that I could do. I didn't wanna make promises. I didn't feel up to doing much, but I was told just to show up and I could do that. And once I showed up, you know, the rest was given to me or told to me or my hand was held by other people, both figuratively and literally in order to, to teach me or get me to do whatever it was I was supposed to do. Um, Cause as pathetic as I felt in early recovery or as <sighs> insane, I guess, as I felt showing up was always a choice that I could make. Um, and so I did, or I also heard, you know, get yourself so deep into AA that it's more trouble to get yourself out than to stay in. Um, and that's another thing that I am really grateful for is surrounding myself, like making service commitments, not too many, but making service commitments that keep me accountable, that give me a sense that I am doing something of value but also knowing, well, and that surrounds me with people that I love. But the nice thing about doing service in AA is that everyone understands. Like if I start getting overwhelmed, all I have to do is say that and someone else on my team, the team, the huge massive team of AA <laughs> is going to step up to help me. And that's the way it is in my program as well. It's a little bit harder than showing up, but just saying, I need help, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what the hell to do right now is, um, is sometimes the only thing that I can do, but it's the absolute best thing I can do. I'm gonna start <coughs> coughing very soon, so dry, I'm so tired. Uh, but thank you so much for having me tonight. This is a wonderful meeting.